would like to call the Monday, August 26, 2019, Grafton School District Board of Education meeting to order and ask everyone present to please rise for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We will turn to public comment. I draw your attention to the agenda. We've added some clarifying language here, at least in just a second, just to talk about public comment. This is going to be the standard verbiage that we see on the agenda. Uh, public comment are for things not on the agenda. We want to make sure that we limit time relative to those matters and also that the public understand and know that those are not items because they're not agenda items that we will comment on during the portion of the meeting so just for reference all right now public comment <laughs> hi everyone i'm lisa Tegla petra and i'm here representing the grafton education foundation just to give everyone an update this month we've had a very productive and busy summer um, in July and August, we held two special sessions at the River Room in Grafton to help spread awareness within our community about the, G the GEF. We continue to grow in membership, but of course, always welcome more involvement. Our organization staffed a table at school registration again this year and presented, I believe this morning, at the staff welcome back meeting as we want to make sure all staff members know what our mission is and how we can help. Um, as we spread the word about the GEF, we want to thank this community and our district for all of your ongoing support. A few weeks ago, McDonald's actually reached out to us for their grand reopening and gave the GEF the opportunity to receive 10% of the profits for one entire business day on August 15th. So we scrambled together a group of members that stepped up and greeted and served the patrons of McDonald's that entire day, and then in turn, we received the 10% of the profits. Um, that said, we have a couple of upcoming fundraisers in the fall. On September 22nd, we will hold our Portraits in the Park fundraiser at Lime Kiln Park from 9 a.m. until noon. It's a great way to get an amazing family portrait and support the GEF. Families are asked to sign up through our website, but it's also in the district news. Um, seeds to Harvest mailer will also go out in the fall to all district families and community supporters. A bit of sad news to share, um, our deepest condolences go out to the family of Carol Stilmack, a longtime volunteer for the GEF. For years, um, we used her for a lot of our graphic design expertise. She designed the Super Bowl logo, the Seeds to Harvest logo. Um, she will always be remembered for her willingness and being able and ready to tackle any challenge, no matter what the deadline. Her dedication to this community will be sorely missed. She truly was a gift to Grafton and to the GEF. A celebration of her life will be held on September 14th. Um, thanks again for all of your support, and we're looking forward to a great start of the school year. Thanks, Lisa. Anyone else? Hi, for those of you that don't know, I'm Mike Bergman, uh, math teacher here at Grafton High School and the uh, head softball coach. Um, I'm here by, want to speak tonight real quickly on behalf of myself and Brian Durst, the head baseball coach. Um, there's an item coming up later on this, uh, in this agenda that you guys are going to be talking about the uh, baseball and softball fields. And it's uh, several years of, uh, of work and time has gone into the planning process and everything else. And we are very excited to hear about the culmination of all those talks and how um, the field upgrades are going to be taking place um, and hopefully will be done uh, in the very near future. And so we just wanted to introduce ourselves and say that we are excited about the uh, the future of uh, both of those programs. Um, we're anxious to uh, to get out on the new fields once uh, once that uh, process is completed. Um, and we're excited to hear about the discussion tonight, um, looking at all the different details, um, how the, the money is going to be allocated, and uh, and just to, to see the, the, the final steps of the, the process that we've uh, been excited about for a few years now. So thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone else? All right, seeing none, then uh, we'd move to the consent agenda items there. We have two items for 
Approval tonight, the minutes of the July 22nd, 2019 board meeting and the statement of receipts and expenditures for uh, July 2019. The motion to approve those consent agenda items. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, aye. 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 Opposed? And it passes. Move on then to the superintendent's report. Yes, so um, we are excited <coughs> to have all of our, our teachers in place um, for this year. Um, as of last week, we had all of them in place, and then we'd had a, um, an illness at the high school with an art position, and so that long-term sub that we'd had uh, secured has, has, not, has not been able to do it. So now we're looking um, for a substitute in that way, but we had all teachers um, that were starting new uh, last Wednesday with new teachers on Wednesday and Thursday. Um, and then today we had all of our staff, um, welcomed all of our staff back, um, and um, great opportunity for us to recognize teachers for years of service. So we had 38 staff members that we recognized today ranging from 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, and one with 45 years of service. Um, and then we also had a new recognition of recognizing staff members um, that had perfect attendance um, for the year. And we had seven staff members that had perfect attendance. Um, I'll mention their names, Ryan Brogelman, Cheryl Cornell, Bob Geiger, Carl Hader, Bev Hemley, Jenny Juder, and Shereen Mortag were all recognized for perfect attendance. Um, the staff members, the 38 that we recognized with their years of service, we will continue the tradition that we started last year with the banner um, in each of our buildings with their picture and their years of service um, underneath that. Um, it's unique in that we have, you know, I think we had one at 25 or two at 25, one at 30, two at 30, one at 35, one at 40, one at 45. So it'll be arranged a little differently. Um, but great, great recognition for staff, their years of service, dedication to our kids. Um, thank you for, to those that were able to be there today and take part in thanking our staff for their commitment to our students. Um, and then uh, the GEF did speak, Renee Riddle was there um, and gave a, an overview of um, GEF to all of our staff, talked about the seeds of harvest. Um, they, the, they have a great little two minute, like minute and 50 some second video um, which was great to see showing excitement from staff over the years um, when they received the grants and so forth. So um, great for our staff to hear from the GEF as well because um, it's such a big supporter um, of, our, of our staff um, and our students. And then next week, um, a reminder that we have staggered starts um, for students next week. So starting this week, we have our late start, our, our great start conferences. Um, those start at the elementary school on this Wednesday from 12 to 8 and then Thursday from 745 to 1145. And the first day of school for elementary students will be on Wednesday, September 4th. Uh, the middle school has their sneak peek this Wednesday from 6 to 8. And then 6th graders will start on Tuesday, September 3rd with their 8th grade web crew mentors. So they're there all day with just 8th graders having an acclimation to the, the building and their schedule. And then all students will be at the school on Wednesday, September 4th. And the high school has 9th graders only for the morning of Tuesday, September 3rd with their Blackhawk crew mentors. Um, and then all grades join them at 11.30. So it'll be a busy week this week as they get ready to welcome students back into their classrooms. Um, excited in that way. And then uh, a final note of, of thanks to both Dr. Gunderson and Mr. Lorge uh, for representing the district um, in meetings with the village over the past few weeks um, as I was unavailable at those dates. Um, there was an issue that had been raised from a resident about parking issues at Kennedy. Uh, there was a possibility of restricting parking during school hours on 11th. Um, AV was discussed at the village safety and the village board meeting. Um, the village board did not uh, restrict parking, um, but Dr. Gunderson is working with staff to implement some ideas to help alleviate um, the residents' concerns. One example is even today um, talking to staff about parking in the lot and not parking on the street, um, sort of accessing that. So we'll, we'll monitor that situation moving forward. We want to be a good neighbor um, to the residents in the area, um, but we want to thank both of them for taking time and, and being there. And, I believe Mr. Nada was there as well, um, as we appreciate um, you doing that for us. Um, and that concludes my report. Just a reminder, there is a village liaison committee meeting Wednesday, right? There is. Our first village committee, yes, liaison meeting is this Wednesday at 6 o'clock. The new and improved village liaison committee meeting. We haven't met since 2013, I, I think, is what the last one <laughs> I want to, I want to clear, confirm because I, I saw that on my phone and I didn't put that on there. So thank you for, for having that on there. That's correct. Yep. <clears throat> Six o'clock. All right. Then we'll, um, any questions for Jeff? I thought it was a, a, a great 
couple of hours this morning that I was able to participate, and uh, just the excitement in the cafeteria, in the commons area is just, it's unbelievable. You know, the, the, the volume levels are up, and just a lot of excitement, a big buzz every year for the start of the school year, so keep the excitement going. So, all right, let's move on to the personnel report. Yes, we had a number of people that we hired since our last board meeting in preparation. We had uh, Melissa Trillo, who was a 4K teacher at Kennedy Elementary School. Emily McKay, special ed teacher at Woodview Elementary School. Rebecca Rana, special education teacher at Grafton High School. Elizabeth Sand, special education teacher at John Long Middle School. And Carrie Slominski, business education teacher at John Long Middle School. So we would ask for the board's approval for those hires. Um, informational. We had new hires with some of our um, aides. We had Megan Clays, the special ed aide at John Long Middle School. Constance Kincaid, a kindergarten aide at Kennedy Elementary School. <coughs> Judy Rissick, um, who special ed aide um, who has been with us in the past and now is back um, at Kennedy Elementary School. Um, and Aaron Williams, a kindergarten aide at Woodview Elementary School. And then we have a couple change in positions of Melissa Dolly um, moving at Kennedy from kindergarten aide to special education aide. And Brittany Hagerman, um, is doing the same thing it would be from kindergarten aid to special education aid and then we have three resignations of uh, marion esperanza john long middle school uh, michelle mangan special ed aid john long middle school and kelsey smith special education aid of john long middle school okay so i think we have to approve the five new hires that are presented and the one resignation uh, no there are the resignations are all um, all hourly right. employees. Hourly yeah. employees. Yeah. Okay. Marianne was, was one of our secretaries at the middle school. Okay, so then I would entertain yeah. a motion uh, to approve the uh, five new hires as presented. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, aye. 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 Opposed? And it passes. All right, the annual seclusion and restraint report. And Laura will walk us through that. All right, Wisconsin Act 125 went into effect in the fall of 2012 and its intent was to protect students from dangerous seclusion and restraint practices. One of the requirements is that any staff um, in the district that would engage in any seclusion or restraint so Mike Kalina, who is our Dean of Students, he is our district trainer, and he was recertified this summer, and last week he trained approximately 53 people in the district. These include regular and special education teachers, paraprofessionals, principals, and some administrative assistants. Um, another part of this law also requires that the school or the district collect data on these instances and then report out to you annually in the fall. Um, as you can see, in the 2017-18 school year, we had nine instances of seclusion and seven instances of restraint. This involved a total number of students, five students, so as you can tell, some of them were involved in multiple instances. And all of these students were students with disabilities. Now, in comparison to last year, we had a few less restraints, but we had more seclusions. You know, that number is going to vary a little bit from year to year, depending upon you know, the, the student and their needs. I mean, our ultimate goal is to teach students emotional regulation and coping skills, but we also have to balance that with the safety of the student and of the staff and the other students in the building as well. Questions? I'm assuming Mr. Kleiner is the in-house non-violent crisis intervention trainer. And then it says that each school must have at least one member trained in these techniques. That would be the 53 members yes. represented across all three schools or trained in those Four schools, yes. Okay. okay. Is that number of trainees, is it the same as last year or is that higher or lower, do you know? I think it's a little bit higher. I mean, the training is good for two years. So these 53 can go another two years before getting retrained. All right, then uh, we need to, it's information only, we don't need to take any action. All right, thank you very much. All right, item D, John Long Middle School Baseball and Softball Complex Update. All right, uh, I have a memo with some information <coughs> included in the packet. Um, 
we have information regarding the costs with the, uh, the complex. Um, as we approved at the June board meeting, we, uh, we have a, a bid to put install turf for baseball and softball varsity fields uh, for the $369,000 uh, with a mound that would come to 300, a portable mound that would come to 381,000. Uh, when that came up, there was quite a bit of discussion because that was well under uh, the, the estimated costs for what turfing baseball and softball would be. There was discussion over the possibility of there being um, funds available out of that original $800,000 that we levied um, just this past January. And so we needed to come back with the cost of doing the other project that was approved by the board, the JV baseball field that would be located um, on the uh, John Long Middle School complex. And so we have an estimate for that piece at just a little bit shy of $290,000 total with the synthetic turf installation as well as the JV baseball field uh, being installed. That would come to 290, uh, that would come to about $671,000, meaning there would be roughly $129,000 <coughs> available. Uh, what we have listed are a number of projects with their estimated costs that could be completed in conjunction with the turf installation that's occurring this fall, should be complete by the end of October. Um, so these are in front of you for your consideration. They could be done now. They could also be done later. If done later, the cost would be roughly 10 to 20% more. Um, but based on the discussion that had occurred um, at the last meeting, we wanted to bring this forward to you so you as a board could make a decision uh, with having some options uh, with that $800,000 that had been allocated. Um, and again, those optional projects, you can see doing the turf foul extensions. If we were to do both fields, that would certainly uh, strip beyond what is available um, after doing the two approved projects. The, the, the backstops, if we were to do both of those, those would roughly come in at about what that cost or what the available funds is. And then you can see a, uh, another, a third, if you will, third priority uh, that the, the um, program put together. So this is uh, to you now to discuss, to have questions about, um, to consider uh, these options um, as to how to use the $800,000 of Fund 41 funds. Questions, discussion? I've got a few questions. Um, James here. So I, I noticed in the 20 year plan, you've also got 15,000 allocated for drainage mm -hmm. at both varsity baseball, varsity softball. As that relates to the foul line extensions, is that going to be done in conjunction? Because I know there's there's puddling behind first base on the varsity softball, and there's puddling in left field. To me, it seems like both outfields need to be leveled, you know, before doing the foul lines. Otherwise, we may be going back to those as you level out those outfields. Yeah, so, so it's a work in progress, and we've been basically in the last five and a half years, now with that 15,000, we've invested roughly uh, $56,000 into renovations, uh, safety upgrades, and what, what this involves is a sand trenching. Uh, so what we're doing is improving the subgrade, and then every year we try to bring, bring the field back up. Level, uh, versus renovating, which um, is obviously very costly. Right. And and even when you renovate a, a, a field with natural turf in Wisconsin with the freezing thawing, within a couple of years you're going to have in, imperfections. You're always going to have so. So this is a, this is a uh, something that's been very successful in, in Michigan State, a lot of other places. Uh, so so that's what's that's what. 
tried to do that. Okay. So but he also feels it's we're all, we are always working with them. <coughs> so it's a gradual. It is with a long, yes. long yep. term process. Yep. Okay. Exactly. And, and this company understands that, and I think the artificial turf will also improve the drainage in those locations. But it doesn't level the. I mean, because I know <laughs> past experience, those the whole fields are not level, mm -hmm. especially the softball field, yep. left field and right field. Yeah, we had a company come in probably roughly five years ago, and it leveled it, but it didn't hold it. So I mean, it, it, like I mentioned, uh, being in Wisconsin, it's always in the Midwest. It's always going to be a challenge. Okay, and question on the backstops. Curious why they're the same configuration because I know varsity baseball has a much larger fence line down first base. And that was, I know, a donation years ago because of safety issues. So, this configuration, does it replace that entire fencing? All the way down to the dugout on the first base side. So, say this again. Which field? The varsity playing? baseball. Okay. And because there's a tall fence around home plate, and then it extends down to the first base dugout. Yes, going well, halfway down, correct. Well, it goes all the way to the dugout. The dugout. Yes, to the uh, dugout. Yeah, not the first base. Yes. So does this configuration replace that entire thing? Because it's, I mean, it's the same size. And I, I, I would think the <coughs> softball, I know the softball field needs something because that's a very short, maybe a single or two pane panel fence behind home plate. Yeah. And there are balls flying out of there all the yeah. time. Yeah. So I could see that, but I, I am concerned about, it seems to me it's either really big for softball or too small for baseball because they're the same size. And I, I'm not sure exactly. So that, is it a quote that... Um, These are the numbers that we that received from Jody. Yes. So, so it is to replace it. Yes. Oh, okay. We would replace the backstops. And yes, they're quoted at the at the same size. That's how we put it in there. And I believe um, you see that at the the JV baseball field that is what's, what's there, set there. to be uh, put into place there, <coughs> especially with that being by the street, and that would have to be replaced. Yeah, I guess I'd want to make sure that that taller fence along the first baseline at the current varsity baseball field remains intact because if we don't that's definitely a, a safety issue so, so is the question you're asking is is that just to confirm that the varsity baseball one is at least what we currently have yeah that, I mean because answer, right? they're the same size right. it doesn't seem right. proportionate sure. given the size of the fields sure. so we can we can confirm that you know since we don't know what the current is but you're right if you're saying, if you're saying softball smaller now and they're both the same is that too big for softball or is it not big enough for baseball is that right. right okay we can ask that. And I guess I would then, ex do, are we going to need something similar on the first base side for the JV field to keep it off the street? I mean, I'm assuming that tall fence on the first base side is because of the concession stand. Correct. For safety. Yeah. I mean, will that same thing be required? Actually, both sides, because what's on the third base side? Parking. Yeah, parking will just need a little parking for that road. <coughs> is there a road parking there still? Or? No. I think the parking got moved to yeah. the new lot yeah. on the yeah. west. There's parking there. There's yeah. parking. Yeah. The, the, uh, but we we'll probably need to confirm that. The foul extensions, so the 15 feet, so I take it that's the foul line to the fence? Yes, to the outfield fence. And is that is that normal? Or is it usually just a strip or is it foul line all the way to the fence? To the fence. 
That width is the, a standard width, 15 feet. That seems like an awful lot. Well, it, it, it'll taper off too as it gets closer Just to the bubble. Oh. Oh. It's, it's not as wide, so it, it won't, I wouldn't think it would fall it down. Right, and it's probably wider, closer to the dugouts, and, and then narrows down right, to probably taper, taper, seven feet right. or something. Right. Especially on the girls' softball. Especially on the softball. Yeah, girls, yeah. You know, the baseball is probably pretty. It's small, not as much. Not as much, yeah. We have the 290 for the JV field. It says estimate for JV. But it yes. looks pretty detailed in here. Did we get a, it also says we would bid this out in the fall. Right, this is not bid out. Okay. So this isn't a contract per se. These are the estimates and they include um, a 10% contingency added into the costs. But we won't have final numbers until we bid out. They could still vary. It could, but these these are these are safe numbers. And I would assume multiple bids for this. Sure. The um, I know there was some concerns about the pavement around the baseball field um, cracking and how that is as far as ADA got brought up. Was the spectator area is that addressed at all or for the, for the baseball side yeah so i have all uh, i have it in my uh 20 year capital improvement money in there however right now it is 88 okay uh that's not an issue <laughs> yes the asphalt is breaking up I mean, yeah. older but but we are in the life on the baseball field. And that's in there for 2020, 22-23? I believe you're correct. I think that's what I saw. Speaking of the 20-year plan, I also noticed, curious on the longevity of the turf, because there was money set aside like eight years down the road to replace the turf. Yes, we asked about the, the longevity. It's an eight to 10 year <coughs> uh, life expectancy. Uh, so we took really for the capital maintenance plan we took the worst case scenario and plugged money in for replacing it eight to ten years uh, or replace it in eight years not assuming that it would make it ten yeah and that can be adjusted as it is we use this and the wear uh, portable mound and that's assuming that's for you Brian <laughs> Yeah, that's actually one of the pieces that, um, as we get into some of the details of what we're doing, that um, to reconsider the affordable bond and, and move to a permanent um, I don't know if you can speak more to that as far as um, sure. the thought process behind it. That was involved in those yeah. conversations. Yeah, I think Topher and I probably both could have. I mean, with meeting with Jody, you know, it was brought to our attention that uh, he recommended, and Topher, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but he recommended a portable mound uh, heavy enough that it would take, you know, in his, in Jody's words, about four or five, you know, grown men to probably carry it from place to place. So it never, in his eyes, never really had an effect on, um, on play. But it enables, if there's ever a switch in dimensions, ever another team that that needs is in need of different dimensions, pitching dimensions, to be able to move that 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 pitching mound off of there. That other so that other adjustments could be made to that field. Uh, if there was a in Jody's eyes, if there was a in his experience, if there was a permanent mound down there, um, and you put a, a, a youth mound in front of it, that permanent mound of regulation would be an immediate obstacle for any plays that needed to be made on that side of the field. Kids would need to negotiate that mound, let's say, to, to catch a pop fly, something like that. Uh, that was what was explained to us by Midwest Sports. So, are there plans that? Do like a 50 70 so that you put different pegs in there for bases I and mean, that, that'd be the only time in my mind you differ use a portable mound to move it up yeah to a I, 50 70 dimension i think that was part of the conversation as a, as a possibility yeah little league uh, when we had met with little league that was one of the pieces when they talked about their challenges with field availability that they would be interested in being able to convert it 
Now they would cover the costs of obviously putting in those pieces that make it um, convertible in terms of the base paths. And that's where I, I, I know that the players would definitely uh, feel strongly about that, the contingency pitch off of, off of that. The bigger you are, the older you get, the stronger you get. And there's just so much more force going into a mound and, and pushing off of a, the pitching rubber that for the bigger kids, it would make more sense to have a permanent mound in place and then to, uh, if there were adjustments for a new, uh, to play on there, then, then slide a portable mound in for younger kids up in front of the, the full size mound. And that's uh, that's what I've seen done in more situations than that. The <coughs> field is what it is, but then uh, I've seen it made to accommodate for you uh, to play on it and adjusting base, uh, base distances and things like that. So, and the force that, that a younger kid would put on a mound would not move it nearly as much as what a, a 150 to 200 pound kid, a varsity athlete, uh, it, it just, uh, especially on turf. And I know it's heavy to maneuver, it's heavy to transport, and, and it doesn't seem like it would go anywhere, but they do. They, they do uh, tend to, to shift and they do tend to, uh, that is definitely a concern. It, and the portable would be a turf versus a natural dirt permanent. And either, yeah, either way would put the permanent as long as it would be either. permanent and in the ground. I guess the other thing in the softball field, there's obviously different distances for the rubber. Is that and it was brought up at one point that the Stingers program or Little League would have uh, an opportunity to help to provide the costs for those additional yeah, cause there's like placements. Four different distances from that I'm aware of. Like Cor correct. 30, 35, 40, 43, and 46. Six. Correct. So if there was going to be multiple use of that field, that would be ideal is that there'd be a spot to move those, those in there. So I don't, I don't know if the league, um, I don't believe Stingers has had any contact with that. Um, I'm not sure if they have or not, but um, I probably would have heard about it if there was. Um, that was a discussion at some point. I right. think that would be something that would be best done in the initial installation. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. If I'm understanding it correctly, Topher, you feel like we have a, a good bid that came in less than what we <laughs> expected? Uh, yeah, for the turf installation. I yeah, and if we don't take action, it's only going to go up, right? Oh, if we well, we're doing. We have the contract to do the turf installation. Yeah, we're doing that. Okay. Um, now there is there are alternative bids, which that cost would go up if we didn't do it right now, like anything would. So you'd like for us to take action so the cost doesn't. Well, we just we've already approved this. Spread. Right, right. We're not to be that. It's the yeah. it's the additional it's funds the as. In previous board discussions, there were a variety of opinions expressed um, as to what to do with that money. So we're bringing it to you now um, with information that can help you make a decision. Right. We approved the turf for baseball and softball. And we approved moving the field. We just haven't gotten the bid yet. Correct. For that cost. So this is an estimate. And then we're saying we'd have, if this estimate holds, an extra 129000 for other projects. Correct. Which are in order, according to this memo, of preference. Because clearly we can't. This is 416000 and we'd have 129000 Oh, you do that, them all? Okay. Yeah. Right. Right, so it's... Yeah, so my input is to the board would be that we take action sooner rather than later so that <coughs> costs don't escalate and we just get less for well, we word. we did already take the action right this is getting done yes mm -hmm. so that's we have the contract already for this the turf will yeah. be should be finished and installed and finished by the end of october from the there's no time concern time. about that price going right. up right unless we add correct these optional projects and i guess i'm not comfortable adding the additional 
optional projects at this point. I, I'm concerned about stripping down the follow lines when those fields are leveled off, and I think we need to do that at some point. Both outfields really need to be fully renovated. To me, putting in turf now and then offsetting potentially the the, the uh, elevation of that outfield, we'd be going back and doing those 15-foot strips on those fields potentially because they're not going to be at the right height. So if you know, it's going to save us 10 or 20 percent now, but in the long run, we'll be coming back potentially to do it because they're not level with the rest of the field. Doesn't make a lot of sense. And the, the backstops, I, I, I'd be in support of doing the softball, but I, I, I'd like more information on the baseball because of what the current configuration is. Because the two just don't, like I said, either one's really big and one's really small. I, I meant, I'm not sure. I think Brian has, there's maybe some discussion about the portable versus permanent mound that needs to take place yet too. Sure. So potentially this 381 could be lower if we decide to change our mind on the portable mound. Although potentially. Well, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there'd be some cost. Then. Sure. Yeah, Timing-wise, for the JV, that's not now. That's next. Year. That will be next right. year. So we'll use the JV field up here next spring, and we'll start next spring, summer, whatever. We'll start getting that put into place for the spring of 2021. So help me out one more time, Jamie or Mark. Uh, the is it, uh, it, I understood Jim to say that we would not, in his opinion, fully renovate the outfield. So, I mean, that's what I heard. Correct. Right? And I guess I look at it, and I, I understand Jamie, James' point. He's strapped for money. But I also look at it like we're going to put in turf in this infield, and then the rest of the field isn't done right. Yeah, and, and, and make no mistake, that has never been conversation that's not this is what Jamie wants to do yeah, I mean I would love to renovate but but the conversation from the coaches I mean this is the best um, natural turf field in, in the North Shore Conference I mean so we have been renovating we've been have been proving them but if that's a direction somebody else wants to go absolutely I guess I'm trying to understand better the difference between full renovation and the incremental approach that it sounds like you're doing. So, so you do not lose a season with the method um, that we're doing or with the outside contractor, um, slowly building them up, slowly improving them uh, versus renovating them and losing that field. Probably cost too. But that, that has never been the approach that I've been directed to go from coaches or anybody. Uh, absolutely, we can, we can look into that if that's what the board wants. Well, I guess I would, what's the value of one over the other? I mean, the, the, the qualitative value, not the financial value, but the qualitative value from the player's perspective, from the coach's perspective of a fully renovated field versus this incremental approach that appears to be working on our field, mm -hmm. um, is there a way to establish a qualitative value? In other words, how do we determine which one is better? We know it would seem to be full renovation is going to be significantly more costly and significantly more disruptive, mm -hmm. right? But absent that, are we doing a disservice to the field? Are we doing a disservice to the players from a from a safety perspective, from a performance perspective, from a, what other, you, know, if you think in threes, what's the other perspective? Two is enough. <laughs> Playability. Playability. Right. Are we canceling games I mean, because there's right. puddling out there? Because there's puddling. I mean, I mean how, how, how do we evaluate that? How, uh, 
a lot. How does one go about evaluating that? Can we put that to our to the professionals and ask for their opinion? I would I, I would lean on the coaches and we have leaned on the coaches and they, they have never expressed that. Uh, so if, if that is a wish of theirs, I, I would like to hear from them. As a question, how much damage does, um, does the sand trenching do? Like, what is that process? Is sort of, would that damage turf that is laid down down the fault lines? Would that be something that? It would not. And you could play on it the next day. But, but it's a process, you know, Brian, it's, you know, we've been having these conversations and, and um, I've been only hearing that was not a priority. Nobody has said, that's the first time we've ever heard of that from Mark. So um, we're willing to do any, whatever direction you guys want to take us. But I guess well, I'm not willing yeah. to. Yeah, we, we, what we could do right. is we could we could reach out to Jody, and if it's not Jody, then it's somebody else to say, what are the costs, right? What what is the, the cost basis to do this? We know what we're doing now, and the cost basis for that. What would be that that total thing? So you'd almost have a comparison. Is what I'm hearing you well, say. Well, but right, but cost in addition to right. the other and qualitative you'd be able factors to, you'd be able that would be answer that. playability, right. uh, yep. safety, you know, performance, long term, you know. You, you, some, yeah, sometimes you might have to just bite the bullet and, and invest a lot to get 20 years out of something versus, well, we could in, invest incrementally Which and get the same soccer. 20 years. So an example with soccer. Yes, that's so exactly we did, right. We, we give up a season or a season and a half um, in order to have a playable surface that looks great and kids can play on. Um, so um, some the district isn't willing to do that, but that was where mm -hmm. you tried other things along the way and it wasn't working. Right. And so then you had to do a, a redo. So. Mm -hmm. So as far as with the follow-up pole extensions, if we were not to proceed with that, it what stops at the outfield? And, and so are there some schools that have that, or is is it is it a mixed bag? Yeah. Okay. Uh, where the normal dirt infield. So it'll go all the way to the fence. The crowns around the infield. So two, yeah, so no, to, the, to, to, to the fence. fence. To the fence. Right. Yes. To the fence. Okay, other questions, comments? So I, I gather from the discussion that this is really discussion only at this point. Further information would be needed. I would just, uh, um, it would be your recommendation that we go out and seek bids for the JV field? Yes. I mean, formal bids. Everybody in mm -hmm. agreement with that? Okay. Um, then as it relates to additional information, we need clarity on the portable mound, right? Yes. Clarity on the backstops. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we need uh, information relative to a new and complete renovation versus incremental improvements that we're currently undertaking, both costs and qualitative factors, including playability, safety, performance, longevity, is that just the, just the baseball, uh, varsity baseball outfield that you're talking about? Yeah, I don't. I, yeah. Yeah. Scope yeah. wise. You think that issue exists? I, well, yeah. I, I know it exists. exists. <laughs> yeah. I would with the JV field. I would also look to the uh, contractors on the backstop and what they feel is a. A suitable size safety wise on given which field? on the JV the when the bit that goes out for bid is it just three panels or do they would they recommend more because of its location next to Fifth Avenue? Sorry, I was I was reading this memo here for a second. What was that again? <laughs> so in the JV field for when that goes out for bid, I would also ask the contractors if 
what they feel is a, a, a suitable size for the backstop given its location along Fifth Avenue. It should be extended down the first baseline like it is at Ninth Avenue. Okay. And I, I want to be clear that if, if we don't approve any one of these optional bids tonight, it, it will not likely be done in conjunction with the current project that's being done this fall. I don't. I understand that. I, okay. Until we have a bid for the JV field, I don't. I don't know how we approve additional spending. As good as these numbers might be, it doesn't seem to make sense to. Unless we're just saying we're, we're definitely going to go over the 800 and allocate more resources. I'm not saying yes or no to that. But we don't have a bid for the JV field, which we already approved. Once we get bids for that and we can make a decision if it comes in at 290, then we have an extra 129,000 as opposed to saying, let's just assume that's good and we'll do some of these projects and then we might have issues you know, that aren't even addressed in this or weren't even brought up by anybody until tonight with the outfield. You know, and then now we need extra money. Okay, so you're, you're proposing we wait until we have a bid? Yeah sometime this winter to reevaluate. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And at the same time, we can get answers or we get further clarity on these items that were just presented. Um, yeah, but the, the, just to be clear, the portable mound, it, it, it's really, that's their recommendation. So it's not that I don't need more clarity in this first I've heard that there's a, <coughs> so we've had meetings with the coaches to talk about these things. So the portable mound thing is is something that we can, we can go over the recommendations just because they recommend us, maybe we have to do it. I know he does say there shouldn't be a clay mound um, because of the turf and then get that getting into there and some of the pieces that went with that. But so we can totally see what is that other option that would go with it. But there was probably not a lot of research because that was their recommendation that went that these other pieces we can, we can address and bring back information on that. I mean, do we need to have the mound decision come back to us? I don't think so. I don't think so. No. I mean, I've seen a mixed bag. I hope. Oh, dirt, dirt mounds and, fort and turf mounds. I, I don't know. I mean, obviously, Capco has dirt and Bay has turf. Yeah, no, that doesn't have to come back here. Yeah, that's, that's what I want to put back. Yeah. So, so just one question on the backstop. So the backstops, we're thinking that that would be a replacement to what we physically already have there, correct? At the JV field, yes. But at the softball field, the JV, if we were to make it bigger, that's going to make the the back of the, f the field bigger, correct? So it's gonna make the width of the field bigger? If we, if we add more panes, is that gonna make no, it? No, I think it would just, because right now I think there's like a single tall, not even that tall, behind home plate, and then coming on the corners is like probably. So it's just gonna go more back towards So I think it would probably else. be back, it'd be more like three sections back right behind home plate and then panels on the sides going to the dugout. So I guess my only question then, and the turf out? is going to go all the way back. So if we move that later, we have to add turf. Mm. No. Actually, I see what you're saying, Steve. Is that, yeah, depending on, depending on how they lay out, I mean, I can see both. I, it depends on what the, the plan is, which mm -hmm. I guess is why they recommend doing two projects. Correct. So that it's one smooth process. I guess I, I I never went out and took measurements, but I mean, assuming the dugouts are staying where they are, it depends on how, like, what sort of arc you take there. If it goes farther back, then to your point, Steve, you, the turf would have to extend out there. Correct. So if it's not done during the initial installation, then later on, then yeah, there'll be a gap that would exist. Correct. Yeah. I don't know, I, I believe, and I wasn't in every meeting, but I believe the meetings that I was in, Jody had said that these are things that could be done. At, now it would save money, but you could do it later and it wouldn't impact the turf at all. Okay. That is correct, right? That's what, that's what he's told us. Is yes. So I, I, I just pulled it up online and sort of see what the visualization of it, but that's what he had said is that it didn't, it would save us money because this team's here, they're already mobilized, you're doing both fields, so it would save money, but it wouldn't be something that would cost us money in the future okay. yeah. for that. Yeah, I guess the only one I could possibly see doing now would be the backstop on the varsity softball because there's cost savings and it's inefficient or, or inadequate in my mind at this point. I mean, it wasn't originally made for 
varsity. It's a varsity sport. So I think that one. And if that cost is less than $66,000, um, I would be okay in considering that one. If the rest are truly replacements, and then the JV baseball field would be new. If that cost is less, to do it now. Yeah, I would. I would have to think it is, but we'd have to get that verified, correct? That it's not sixty-six thousand, the same as the varsity right. baseball okay. field. Yeah, correct. You would think it would be less. It would be less. I would think. Or the others are just correct. woefully inadequate. Right. Correct. <laughs> They're significantly more. So we can get that clarification. What are you saying, Jeff? If we don't vote for it tonight, it won't happen. It won't happen in conjunction with the turf installation. It's going to be well on its way and finished by the end of October. So if we waited until till the board meeting in September, um, there, there's no guarantee that could be done together. So to that point, do we have, I mean, since that field was not originally designed for varsity softball, Correct. right? I mean, it, it was a little league field. Um, is there a safety issue from a spectator perspective relative to the backstop that's there? Yeah. I'm not supposed to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Also, when you take into account the parking lot down the first base side, then also two games possibly going on in conjunction with each other, one on the softball field and one on the baseball field, there is a possibility when engagement on one field is focused in on what's going on at one at one home plate, the respective field might not be paying attention. So there's that factor, too. But when the coaches ranked what they would like to have, they did not rank the backstops as high, so it wasn't as big of a concern. Like, I guess that's the only thing I'm still struggling with is sure. we talked about we're prior. funding something and then saying like, well, that's great, thanks, but what we really wanted was this. So you gave us, you know, something are, that we didn't I, think was even top priority. No, I understand. When, when we talked about priority, and I, and I invited our, my coaches to, to, to chime in here at any time, but we talked about priority. One of the first things that we talked about was their priority being the turf from the foul line on down. They also placed a heavy emphasis on new backstops as well. Um, so it wasn't necessarily a rank in that order, but it was just an, an ongoing conversation. So uh, you know, both they saw as as a need. And guys, if you had any more comment, yeah. it was not without cost, no either. It sure. Just what would your priorities be? So it was yes, but yeah, backs. I mean, to me, for the softball field, they're one and one A. I don't have an issue with that taking priority over the following. Okay, any further discussion? Yeah, again, <laughs> my input is just we. I, I think we should move forward and improve this part of it. But uh, uh, approve which part, John? Because well, what Topher is asking for, uh, well, so we don't have to wait till after right. winter. I mean, he's he's asking for the board to make a decision relative to the priorities that been that have been identified. It seems to me the the synthetic turf foul extensions um, until we have more information relative to the complete renovation versus the incremental improvements, we we can't really move forward with that. Um, the 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 backstops, I I agree. While there may be some merit to getting that taken care of now for the softball field because of the fact that it's probably not adequate at this point. Uh, we're not sure whether this is the right cost, right? So I would propose that because we're talking about perhaps 10% to 20% difference, we just hold on it. We're talking about $6,000, right? Yeah. 
right? I mean, that's that's what you're talking about. And while I'm, I don't want to be or mean to be cavalier relative to that money, if that number is forty thousand for the smaller, or forty-five thousand, we're really not. We don't have enough information to make a good decision at this point in time. So, from my perspective, would be to to hold off on these optional projects until we have more information, recognizing that there may be incremental costs associated with it. But I'd rather make a more informed decision on full information than um, a quick decision on less than good information. I mean, how long will it take us to get that information? But we're looking at this winter going out to bid on the JV baseball field. And you're, you're looking at making that decision sometime this winter. Yeah, what about the the backstop for the softball? Well, that could be, that we'd have that information once I reach out to Jody and get some clarification on that. So if need be, and there was a, a pressing mm -hmm. opportunity for savings, we could have a, a, a quick board meeting in this you know, second Monday of September, yep. two weeks from now. It would committee meetings occurring there. Yeah, I mean, it, it really will be a phone call. I mean, right. Sorry that we don't have the information for you tonight to be able to make that informed choice. Um, I mean, we could do that. If there's, if there's meaningful savings, we certainly could get the board together, a quorum of the board together to make that decision, right? Yeah, I think enough of us here for Okay. You okay with that, John? Thank you a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. Steve, Jerry. Okay, then at this point, uh, we'll, we'll press forward with the um, bids for the JV field. We'll reach out and find out about those backstops, and then the other pieces we'll look for information at a future meeting. Anything else? All right, then we'll move on to the 2018-19 year-end budget report. there is a memo in your packet uh, outlining some information and we have a presentation as well all right well that's not a great thing to look at uh, on the screen necessarily well it looks better over there um, but you have some uh, some handouts um, taking a look at some sp specific line items uh, for how we finished the year, uh, and I included notes, including um, the in the expenditure side, the purchase services and fund ten, um, where we had, um, and this will come up later as we talk about our capital maintenance plan. We did. Uh, basically cover the cost of about $97,000 of Fund 41 projects in that purchase services budget line. And we also dedicated $491,000 uh, toward classroom upgrade, upgrades. We had $306,000 budgeted there, but we, we used the 306 plus we took another 100 that was allocated in the 500 budget line and used it to attack the, the classroom upgrades. Um, so that's why you see that as a higher dollar amount than what was budgeted. And the capital objects budget, uh, that number is coming in higher than budgeted due to the uh, water main break. Uh, we had a couple insurance claims, but mainly it was the water main break. Again, we had over $450,000 in expenses. Um, when, when we look at the revenue, we're gonna see uh, much more revenue than was budgeted because of the insurance claims that came in to cover those costs. So uh, the next sheet shows us the, uh, the revenue. So again, in fund 10, we had additional revenue above what we expected. Uh, we do not budget for Medicaid revenue coming into fund 10. Uh, this money that comes into fund 10 is basically 
a, an adjustment based on prior years when reviews are done. Uh, we find out typically late May or June that we are receiving a payment and it has to be booked into Fund 10. We don't budget money there, but this year we received uh, over $72,000. So that's why the federal funds is coming higher than what we budgeted. And then again, uh, in um, the other revenue under Fund 10, uh, the 900 series, we received insurance reimbursements of over $450,000 to cover those water main costs. That's why that budget line is higher uh, than budgeted. And then you'll also see in Fund 27, the inner fund transfer, that's the transfer that comes from Fund 10 to cover the costs in Fund 27 that are not covered, uh, that are not covered by either grants or state special education aid. That transfer was lower uh, than expected, and this was due to uh, the expenses coming in lower than expected in Fund 27. Uh, so overall, uh, we came in, uh, we had been budgeting uh, a basically a shortfall of $800,000. Back on this chart here, you'll see after a couple of years of increasing our fund balance, we did budget both a total of from 1819 and 1718, total of that $1.2 million that we levied into Fund 41, including $800,000 this past year. Uh, we came in uh, better than expected by about $240,000. So our drop in fund balance is roughly uh, $560,000 this year instead of $800,000. Um, and as I mentioned in the memo, um, we, were ex we had been budgeting to decrease fund balance by $1.2 million over the past two years, and it's dropped roughly about half of that amount. Um, so we have a fund balance ratio now of $4.41 million. That's a ratio of 17.6%, uh, which is above the board goal of at least 15% fund balance ratio. And keeping that healthy fund balance helps us out with having a good credit rating, uh, keeping the district prepared in the event of an unexpected financial loss, um, and also helps lower short-term borrowing costs. Are there any questions with uh, the year-end budget report? Yes. Uh, the first 400,000 was, was that in 1718? 1718. And is that 4.97 after that Correct. 400? Correct, so we, that last is? year, okay. um, as we reported, we had budgeted for fund balance throughout four hundred thousand dollars, and it uh, we did much better than expected. Yeah. So it just dropped the point uh, zero six million dollars. Yeah. Okay. And again, this will be um, basically the year-end financial statement will be presented in more detail at the annual meeting in the treasurer's report. Any questions? All right, then we'll move on to the 20-year capital maintenance plan. All right, we, uh, we've referenced this a few times already tonight. <laughs> so uh, we have in, uh, for this, this capital maintenance plan this past year, we put in the standard contribution uh, into Fund 41 of $80,000, as well as the um, $130,000 that we put into Fund 46. As I mentioned earlier, we did complete uh, $97,515 of projects that were in the 20-year cap plan using Fund 10, thus freeing up future funds. Uh, what we've been able to do over the past three years is between additional contributions that hadn't been budgeted or covering costs using fund 10 budgets, covering the costs out of, uh, of capital, uh, capital maintenance 
plan budgets, uh, we have basically saved about $138,000 on average uh, a year for three years. So that's, it's not a long-term trend, but it's what we've seen over the past three years that's gonna be important as we talk about what we need to average um, in future years down the road. Um, and I mentioned that in the, uh, both in the memo and here up uh, the presentation. It's fully funded all the way until 2027, 2028. And again, Fund 46 comes online July 1st, 2021. We would need to average, in order to have the funds uh, to pay for everything that we have budgeted by 2027, 2028, we'd need to average $53,609 per year of assistance from Fund 10 or additional um, uh, funding into those Fund 41 or Fund 46 budgets. Again, last three years were average 138,000. The largest deficit occurs in 2034, 2035. Uh, that's the total deficit for that year is nearly one million sixty thousand dollars from now until 2034 35 we would need an additional sixty six thousand dollars per year in in either covering those projects out of fund 10 or levying additional dollars into fund 41 or transferring additional funds into fund 46 and again we've been averaging over the past three years one hundred thirty eight thousand dollars per year and included in your packet uh, is a first section uh, that gives you a look at that past three year history. And it's organized by year across the top. Um, then each page goes through different buildings. The projects are listed, the dollar amount is listed. So that first section covers those first three years or the last three years, I should say, of past performance. Then you have uh, another section that covers the uh, next 10 years, going through each of the buildings. And then you, uh, the last portion is the, uh, the second 10 years of the 20 year capital maintenance plan. Um, this isn't, the cap plan isn't great for printing out on paper. It looks much better when you look at it on a computer spreadsheet form. Uh, but we can take any, any questions. Uh, we'd be looking after discussion for approving this capital maintenance plan uh, moving forward. So the big year is 21-22 with the, the track and all that and hopefully through our private partnership we'll be able to find some. Um, yes, the, the Fund 46 funds would become available and we do have um, the, the athletic track and the uh, varsity field piece in there, yes. If through our fundraising we're able to get some of that those upgrades made it's obviously going to help our wonderful 20 year capital plan <clears throat> the roof replacement sections that are driving out of your line now way too long 2035 and beyond 3435 I mean, those are based upon current estimates of the sections as of today uh, they, they have inflation built in for it. They have inflation for the cost, yes. but wearability. I mean, it's, this is just following some type of right. standard curve for how long they should last. Yes, and so obviously this gets adjusted every year. Right. Typically you don't adjust those years till you get much closer. I mean, within five years you can feel good about some of the, the estimates on how long something will last. Obviously you're getting out here, it's much further away, but again, being prepared you know, that we know there could be a shortfall well down the road. Are we putting enough money aside uh, based on performance and based on what we're budgeting? It's important to have that in there. But yes, that'll change as we get closer. But what was the amount that we needed to 66,000? Yes, so by between now and 2034-35, we need to average 66,000 in change per year uh, either of covering costs in Fund 10 or putting money, more money aside into 4146. Steve, tell your son because he's going to be sitting 
But, I mean, when I mean, you look at the history over the last three years, we've spent double. We're right. Contributing. Right. That's why we can't, we'll look at this every year. So in August every year, we get to see, does that history change? In which case, then we might start to look at, do we need to make a decision? But right now, based on the, our history and how far out that is, uh, we, we would appear to be in good shape. Right. But it's looked at annually, so again, we shouldn't have anything to sneak up on us. But it's great to have this. I mean, this is, to me, I go back to the whole referendum and all the, you know, all, everything we heard through those listening sessions is, you need to plan for this. Why weren't you planning for it? Well, here we are. We've got this well laid plan for all these maintenance items. For the most part, they're funded, and as we get closer, we can adjust to fund them if we need to, but it's looking really good, and we've got that plan out there now that the community should be happy with. Great. In 2027 28, you replaced the tennis courts and fencing split. Yes. Is that meaning split with the village? No, nope. that is that is a recogni uh, recognition that at the time that that number was in there, there wasn't enough to cover it from either of the funds, um, and that may have changed at this point. But we split it so that you didn't have one fund having a negative balance, like say Fund 41, okay. having a negative $100,000 balance, and Fund 46 having a positive balance. So it was split because it couldn't be covered by one particular fund. But overall, it can, be, it can be covered. I think it's just something that we should add to the liaison. I mean, I know there, historically there was shared responsibilities for that surface, that tennis surface, as well as it may be less so at Kennedy, but certainly at this main tennis facility, there was some shared elements between the district and the village. I don't know if they continue to use it, for their programming. And there used to be village courts that were near the pool, there, right? Mm -hmm. those are and when those went away, there was some shared responsibility. So we should put it on, on an agenda on somewhere. Right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? I didn't know what split meant. I figured that's what it meant. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else on the 20 year plan? Very good. And it's information only. Uh, no, no, sorry. Uh, no, we want to pass. Yep. Okay. So then I would entertain motion to approve the 20 year capital maintenance plan as presented. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor of the motion, aye. 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 2019 20 budget update. All right. Um, again, I have a, a packet in there. Um, I'll get up. For this one over here, I know we've looked at this many, many times between January and now, um, and we have that assumption that we're going to have a three-year membership drop. That three-year membership drop, coupled with the increase uh, in the last budget of $175 per member, and how much we get for each of those members, means that our initial revenue limit calculation comes in basically higher than higher than last year which is nice uh, higher than last year's base which means we won't get a hold harmless exemption but we still get the decline in enrollment because that's a separate calculation you take how many kids you're losing multiply it by that dollar amount per member and then and give that to you for one year challenge of course is that that $245,000 we're trying to replace the, the $588,000 or so that we're losing from last year. But what that means is that's a, a drop in rough, of roughly $237,000 in that revenue limit piece, okay? Some changes that have occurred uh, since we last got together and passed, uh, passed the, the uh, preliminary budget in June, and since the budget has been approved, uh, the governor did use a veto pen to increase the per pupil aid amount. It was originally a $25 per, basically per pupil increase from the prior year. 
it's now $88. Increase per pupil, uh, resulting in additional funding um, for per pupil aid for next year. Uh, we also uh, have more special ed aid coming in, uh, and this is due to finishing the year and having an actual cost for reimbursed uh, next year reimbursed roughly 26% of our costs. So back in June, we were estimating what those final costs would be that we'd be uh, reimbursed on. So we have additional money in uh, special ed aid that we're expecting to get next year. Those would be two of the pieces um, that really drove any change um, between this budget that we presented at the annual meeting um, and the budget that we approved in June. Um, other items that have obviously had an effect on the budget would be we've, we had some outstanding hires back in June, certainly. We've hired those people. They have salaries, um, and almost, almost all of them, at the time that this was put together, had chosen their benefit package. So that would be an adjustment as well. So you'll see the, uh, uh, you'll see a, basically an overview of that budget with those different pieces. Um, and again, on the screen, you'll see the purchase services uh, dropping significantly. But again, that was a piece that had a lot of, uh, a lot of funds budgeted for the classroom upgrades last year. We spoke about earlier, and even in the supplies and equipment line there, uh, we had money budgeted for potentially flexible furniture. We basically uh, focused on classroom upgrades. Um, so uh, having less money in those two items overall means you see a reduction in that budget for next year in those categories. And then the revenue, uh, as I spoke about earlier, revenue limit uh, amount is dropping. Open enrollment, we're trending uh, lower uh, each year. And then you can see per pupil aid and special ed aid, those two pieces, the increase from last year is higher right now than we had been expecting it to be uh, when we passed the preliminary budget in June. So we have a balanced budget uh, with uh, expenditures going up uh, about 2.2% uh, between Fund 10 and Fund 27. Uh, we'll still have um, certainly um, more information that we have to get in October. We'll have final membership counts, state aid that we'll be looking at, final revenue limit calculation. Um, additionally, and I mentioned this in the memo, uh, we will uh, be bringing forward the potential to refinance some of our Fund 38 debt. That would lower the levy into Fund 38 because uh, there would be some savings there. Then that money could then be levied into Fund 10. So that would have uh, a positive impact on our revenue budget for Fund 10. So I want to make mention of it here. We'll likely have that at the next board meeting uh, for you to look at. Uh, and then when we look at the upcoming budget year, with a, a balanced budget, we have that $4.41 million uh, fund balance. You'll notice that the um, next year's ending fund balance, even though it's the same dollar amount, has a higher ratio. Uh, and that's because the 1819 year end uh, fund balance ratio is measured against actual expenditures for this year, which were somewhat inflated because of expenditures related to the water main break. Next year, expenditures will be lower, meaning that fund balance will be a higher ratio. Any questions on the 1920 budget update uh, that we would like you to approve uh, for use at the, uh, at the annual meeting? answered all of them um, and there was nothing significant there they uh, just a little bit more on this possibility to refinance because our next meeting will be after the annual meeting so to the extent that this, this would be used at the annual meeting uh, and this will be used at the annual meeting yes okay yes we don't have exact figures right now just some estimates of what we ah, could okay. say if we refinanced yeah okay um, but should that refinance you're saying if that if we were to refinance before the end of the year, right? Uh, it would be likely in September, 
then at the October board meeting where we finalize the budget, yeah, okay, we would have a levy for Fund 38 that would likely be lower, um, which would then allow us to have a higher <coughs> levy in Fund 10. Basically, lowering the cost for that that levy, the debt levy within the revenue limit. When you do that, that yeah. puts more money in the classroom. Is this a callable series within Fund 38? Must mm -hmm. be. Yes. Otherwise, we could be able to refinance it. Okay. Any questions? All right, then I would entertain a motion to approve the 2019-20 budget update as presented, for use, uh, which will be used for the development of the um, annual meeting. So moved. Any further discussion? None of those in favor of the motion, aye. 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 Opposed? Construction, uh, no, 2019-20 tax levy and mill rate estimate. All right. Um, so this will also be used at the, the annual meeting. Um, so taking that budget and knowing what we have in terms of a revenue limit uh, for fund tax, the, the tax levy is based on basically what's left over after we get state aid as well as computer and personal property aid. Now for this next year, the revenue limit, because we have fewer members, is essentially, it's, it's dropping, also related to the fact that we can't uh, use both exemptions like we have in the past, dropping about $190,000. Now when you have dropped membership, especially when you couple that with increasing property values in our district, you're gonna have a, a loss of state aid. So that loss of state aid, Right up here, it's expected based on that July 1st piece, uh, the aid estimate that we have, there'll be a drop of state aid of uh, about $929,000. That that turns into what um, what you don't get out of the state aid is to come out of the property tax levy. We're not budgeting for any change in that computer property aid piece. So that drop in membership, dropping our state aid so, so much more significantly than our revenue limit because it's a just one year look back, right? That state aid is calculated based on what happened in 2018-19. The revenue limit is more of a three year average. So as you lose members, the revenue limit is going to drop slower than your state aid line. That's why you see that outstripping uh, the drop of the revenue limit. In addition, in addition, we had an uh, increase in our Fund 39 debt levy and that payments that we made, that is uh, a, a shared cost for negatively gated, so we lose money for that. Baird, however, uh, did consider, we'll look at that shortly, Baird considered that, consider that and how they structure our debt payments over time. So we have that dollar amount right here. This is the property tax levy within the revenue limit after you take the state pay computer and personal property aid that we're expecting to get. And again, we'll know for sure what the state aid is on October 13th. And that gets levied into these three different funds. Fund 38 is to pay that with uh, debt within the revenue limit. We refinance, uh, that number would come down. The Fund 41 levy, that's uh, coming back to uh, normal levels. And of course, then instead of levying the 800,000 here in Fund 41, that's moving back into the Fund 10 levy. Now, where I was talking about our Fund 39 levy being structured to account for the fact that we would lose state aid based on increased payments in Fund 39, you can see our debt payments in Fund 39 are scheduled to drop uh, over $435,000 for 1920 for use of the, the for levy in 2019-2020. That, again, helps absorb that loss of state aid. Uh, and so when you combine the levy within the revenue limit, as well as on 39 outside the revenue limit, you have, compared to last year, an increase in the levy of a little over $300,000. So so that comes to about a 1.6% increase over last year. 
Um, and you can see uh, we're relatively stable after the increase in 2017 and 2018. When you take the total levy of the 18,741,000 and levy it against equalized property values, which are estimated to go up 5.2%, Bigger's uh, estimate is 5.33% right now, but it's just an estimate. We'll get the actual number October 1st. That could be lower, so we're using a lower number uh, just in the event that it might be slightly lower, although the estimate's been very good uh, the past uh, couple of years. So when you levy at 18741000 against the $1,835,000 and such a property value, again increasing 5.2%, get a mill rate of ten dollars and twenty one cents per thousand dollars of property value that's a decrease of thirty six cents decrease of three point four percent from last year's mill rate and you apply that against property values uh, when it comes to getting that tax bill uh, for every hundred thousand dollars of equalized property value that's a decrease of thirty six dollars so for every three then if you have three hundred thousand dollars of property value, equalized property value, uh, that's going to be about a hundred eight dollars of savings based on our mill rate. Uh, so I also have five hundred thousand up there as well. So this would be the tax impact. Um, and we would also have this. Uh, have you approved this uh, for use at the annual meeting uh, in September? Um, and that takes care of the tax. Uh, property tax and no rate. Please. Any questions? So for the change in the mill rate, as I feel like we experienced with the referendum, those numbers are for the district area, right? That includes town of Grafton, the village. It's not necessarily applied evenly, correct? Correct. You're when, talking, if yes. Somebody's looking at their home. It, because last time there was a pretty, you know, the village. Correct. The village was um, two, two years ago um, where the state, they determine how much property value is, is in each municipality. Uh, almost the entire increase went this, I believe, well, maybe it was this year, but almost the entire increase went to the village. There was very little increase in the town. Basically what they're saying is, this is your piece of the pie, and the tax is going to be apportioned based on how big your piece of the pie is. The village pie got bigger, right? That piece got bigger. They had a larger portion as a percentage of the tax levy uh, when compared to the prior year. Okay, so they, they got a decrease, and the town ended up getting a decrease, and because the state said they have more property value, they're going to pay a bigger portion of the tax. Wasn't there something with how often it was? The town pretty much does it every year versus the village. Kind of, you have to be with that. Sort of that person. doesn't affect equalized property values because the, the Department of Revenue determines that, mm -hmm. right? And they do it on an annual basis so that you don't have a municipality determining it by saying we're just going to leave property values where they are so that we don't get an increased tax burden. Um, so they, they take actual home sales and put together that estimate uh, for different municipalities. Um, and and it's, that is completely independent of how different municipalities value properties to individual homeowners. And so basically the, this decrease, to clarify. For municipalities? And split it up, you take one municipality, they split up uh, who knows how many properties. We're just taking the whole number and yes. for our purposes. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Seeing none, I would make a motion to approve. <coughs> Levy and bill rate estimates as presented for use at the annual meeting in September. So moved. Second. 
Any discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the motion, aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes. Thank you, Topher, for this, the budget, and the work to come. <laughs> okay, next is a construction update. All right, we're finally winding down with the construction uh, portion, uh, referendum construction portion of this. But um, so right now, we're roughly about 95, 96% of landscaping is completed. Um, we really have just a fine grading and seeding to be done yet. And most of that will be done middle of September. Um, just because typically this time of year it's dry and we want to wait till um, the seed can germinate. Uh, asphalt was scheduled last Saturday, however, they were held up um, on 17th Avenue, so that will be done this week. And that is the drive going to Highway 60 to finish that. Also a speed bump in between district office and the high school. Uh, power to the to the tennis shed. Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be. There's gonna be a gate. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. We, instead, it's gonna be a, um, a speed bump. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there won't be a. So it's right where the you're there's coming out of the to go up to the high school. They'll, they'll there's kind of a. There. They just yeah. cut it out today. Yeah. Cut out. So you'll see the mm -hmm. cut out today. They cut out today. So where that's almost where the crosswalk is, it's close to that, where kids will feel like there'll be a speed bump. So someone is coming down from high school. Yeah. And they'll have to slow down. I felt it because I flew in there. <laughs> yeah. It's working. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, it's hard because even like buses, some of the buses then will come out that way. It's easier to get um, out yeah. that way. So, as you know, as kids are walking and so forth, there, there's cars and so forth. So, you're going to want to make sure it's a safe safety issue there. That's very common practice with other districts, too, and speed bumps. So, um, power to the tennis shed that will begin in um, September 3rd, the week of September 3rd. So they have to trench power from the football concession stand over to that tennis, which that was originally supplied by GES. That was one of those um, on the punch list and continue to identify things that they need to get contractors back and correct. Um, things are going well. So I'm real happy with that process. And that's all I have. Is carpeting complete? Carpeting is not. Um, there's some minor things that have to happen. Um, just some, some molding, you know, just some minor things. The biggest thing would be the hallway at Kennedy. We'll but we're gonna have to wait till school starts. We'll just capture that um, either a day that we we are off or on weekends. Is there a final or substantial completion date that relative to the contract with Hoffman? Have we passed that? Have we, we have passed that, however, I have not uh, had any communication on exactly when I receive all of those documentations, okay. all the blueprints and, and all. Yeah, so all the as built. Uh, uh, exactly. So I suspect very soon, but I have not started that conversation at this moment. And right now the from a budgetary perspective, that which was presented in June is still holding? Two hundred eight, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Any additional questions? Just one question, Jamie. As far as uh, I wasn't able to make the football game on Friday night, but just with the new parking, with the large crowd, how did that go? With people getting in and out? Um, I was only here till halftime, <laughs> <laughs> and then I did leave. Um, Kevin. I think logistically you're right. There certainly wasn't any complaints about it, but there was no backup. There was, there was no traffic um, flow in, in and out of the parking lot and in and out of the stadium. Pretty well. Good. All right. Thanks, Jamie. You're welcome. All right. Then I uh, would 
would look for a motion to convene into closed session to consider one employment compensation and performance related data of the superintendent and other administrators and two personal histories or disciplinary data of specific persons the investigation of charges against the specific person which would likely to have a substantial adverse effect upon the reputation of any person referred to in such histories or data were involved in such problems or investigation investigation regarding an employee conduct matter now, this is in accordance with the wisconsin st state statutes 1951 c and f i have such a motion so second all right we'll take a voice vote yes John? Yes. Bill? yes 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 and yes thank you